Sorry, y'all. I had to make a part two to this because I was just about to be finished with the third chapter. And there was there's three chapters left, so might as well make a part two to it. And what I just left off is that um, mass incarceration is becoming the thing we know today. How it's easy to um, negate race as how problematic it is. And how the prison label and stuff like that. Is still intact after the Supreme Court noticed that started accepting race discrimination cases. So chapter four, that chapter, this chapter is called The Cruel Hand. So this one talks about um, the stigmatization and marginalization that happens when felons. Um, it goes a lot of story about um, when people get out of prison. But it talks about how the stigma, she's talking about how the stigma of felon is literally equated to the stigma of a slave. Let me get to that part. And she talked about how um, when, during plea bargaining, how guilty pleas um, happen. Because some people, even when they're innocent, they still um, plead guilty because they know there's no way out because of how unjust, is unfair, unjust in the unfair this system can be. So they instead take guilty pleas, and they didn't. And even defense attorneys probably don't know like how extreme a guilty plea can go. Like once you're um, convicted and um, arrested, incarcerated, and then you're go that. Still that felon label is going to be with you. Um, like it's still hard for you to um, reintegrate back and reenter back into mainstream society. So that's like something to think about once you um, go into court and you're, you've been convicted of something that you, you're, you're innocent of, you're not guilty of. But whether to date, take the not guilty or guilty plea. And some people take the guilty plea so they don't have to go into harsher punishment and sentences. But that's like the extent. It's very harsh and brutal what the state can do to you. And... Yeah, Alexander said, Today, a criminal free from prison has scarcely more rights and arguably less respect than a freed slave or a black person living free in Mississippi at the height of Jim Crow. Those related from prison on parole can be stopped and searched by the police for any reason or no reason at all and return to prison for the most minor of infractions, such as failing to attend a meeting with a parole officer. So she was talking about parole violations and how that even leads into um, more incarceration. And she said, A wallet could be mistaken for a gun. Um, Amadou Diallo, who was killed because police thought he was reaching for a gun when he was reaching for a wallet. And the whites only signs may be gone, but new signs have gone up. Notices placed in job applications, rental agreements, loan applications, forms for welfare benefits, school applications, and petitions for licenses informing the general public that felons are not wanted here. So think of whites only signs during Jim Crow. Think of job descriptions say no felons. It's literally another caste system that's and it's related so is related too much to um the old Jim Crow. And I think that's a good analysis of it. And then she talked about um the le legal discrimination of offenders and ex-offenders. So a lot of offenders, they have a hard time getting housing and stuff like that. And there's these restrictions that place on leases for apartments and stuff like that. So they have a screening process. Like, have you been convicted of a felon? Um, if you have, don't even think about applying for housing here and stuff like that. And she talked about the felon box, which is the felon um, question that happens when you um, apply for a job and stuff like that. So if you're, it's hard for you to get a job once you um, have, because you have to check that box. Like if you're not, they're going to go through your records and social security and all that stuff. You have to give like the governing doc government documents and all that stuff once you um, get the job and stuff like that. And she talked about um, 
how it would have been easier if uh, manufacturing that industry was around, but because of um, the deindustrialization period of 1970s, where a lot of jobs um, de declined, a lot of there was a, a unemployment rate that skyrocketed. Um, it it would have been nice if those jobs were still around, but because of industri deindustrialization. It's even harder for um, felons to get a employment. And a lot of the jobs that probably would have accepted them are in the suburbs. So a lot think about it. A lot of them are in urban communities and they're going to have to go to the suburbs in order to, order to get the jobs. And a lot of them are in probably an hour away. So you have to think about employment when you're a felon. And she talked about um, license barriers and suspension. So think of being trying to own your own business. When If you're a felon, it's hard for you to garner license for, say, a barber or a salon or something like that. And a driver's license is hard for you to get a driver's license. And it's hard for you to register to vote. So, And then she went into... Um, how black men even there's even this perception for black men that have no criminal records there is this stigma for that so because of media imagery and stuff like that there is this perception that that um uh black people are are inherently criminal and she talked about how it's hard for felons to first of all get a job in house, but they have a lot of fees to pay when they're in parole. So a lot of them are in debt, so they end up in these diversion programs and it's kind of and when they're in diversion programs, it's similar to convict leasing. Like they have to do some work for the least amount of money and stuff like that. It's like they're basically back in prison and stuff like that. And then she talked about voter suppression and how the restoration process for felons to get the right to vote, it can be so confusing. It's literally like poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses that black people had to fight for during the civil rights movement. So I so I talked about this in the last video about um, this Florida um, legislation that got passed because people went to vote to um, give 3 million people in Florida the right to vote because they were convicted felons and stuff like that. And think about how that would have turned, how the election back then would have been so different if it wasn't for those 3 million felons that were convicted. And um, she talked about even... Even though these barriers exist, she she said that a lot of um, the people that were incarcerated that she um, got to talk to, the worst thing that happened to them is the shame that they had to go through when because of incarceration. So this was this was a very um, profound uh, perspective I didn't think about. Alexander said, the shame and stigma that follows you for the rest of your life, that is the worst. It is not just the job denial, but the look that flashes across the face of a potential employer when he notices that the box has been checked, the way he suddenly refuses to look you in the eye. It is not merely the denial of the housing application, but the shame of being a grown man who has to beg his grandmother for a place to sleep at night. It is not simply the not denial of the right to vote, but the shame one feels when a coworker innocently asks, who you gonna vote for on Tuesday? So you're literally in another world. You're literally in a parallel alternative universe when you're a felon. Like you no, know, it's hard for people to relate. And she talked about how this is even like a secret within families. So yeah, don't tell people you're a felon. Just it's, it's literally like um, a hidden secret that goes within um, communities because there's this stigma that of incarceration. It's like the stigma with HIV AIDS, um, the stigma with um, anything else. You keep you keep that close to you and you have to suppress it. So that's very un it's it makes you really look at um, very look at it the prison industrial complex in a weird, in an interesting light. And 
it allows allows room for respectability politics respectability politics and stuff like that and she debunked this myth that black families don't want to do better so a lot of people that are in poor low income communities they're aware that they're poor and low income they're they they're not just going around um all willy nilly um in in their community they know that the government is neglecting them and they need better resources and the government doesn't care about them they're they're neglected so people they know that they want education they need they know they need quality education and they know they need employment in order to have a sustainable life like it's literally common sense but it's the it's just how we navigate through survive, survive through society on the means of survival and stuff like that and some of that ends up in robbery thievery um, vandalism and stuff like that and you have to understand people just make mistakes some people don't have the resources and the guides in order to actually prosper in society so i appreciate alexander for doing that and she yeah she talked about embracing criminality as a means of survival and she talked about um gangster rap and how it's literally how oppressed communities they um cope with um the society they live when they live in and it's um page 172 i remember i knocked it down she said any wonder then that many youth embrace their stigmatized identity as a means of survival in this new caste system, so being a criminal. Should we be shocked when they turn to gangs or fellow inmates for support when no viable family support structure exists? So what if you're in a toxic ho house? If, so you can shame someone for being a gang, but what if they're in a toxic household and stuff like that? After all, in many at respects, they are simply doing what Black people did during the Jim Crow era. They are turning to each other for support and solace in a society that despises them. So it's literally we all we got. So we're just going to make things that work to the best of our um, our Blackness. And then... And then Alexander talked about um, minstrelsy shows. So for those who don't know, um, Jim Crow originated from a white person that um, puts them put puts themselves in blackface. So a coal or something like that, some paint or something like that, and they do they act like a clown. They do shows and performances making fun of black people. And a lot of people don't even know that there were even black people that participated in minstrel shows. So probably a light-skinned black person, they um, put on makeup and stuff like that. And that enables colorism and stuff like that. And um, Alexander um, paralleled that to um, how blackness is commodified and um, reality TV shows. So... Love and Hip Hop and all that stuff, Flavor of Love, VH1, um, rap music videos, um, Video Vixens, and how all of those are based on, are um, uh, perpetuated through the caricatures and stereotypes that um, Black people have always been going through. And, you know, she pretty much talked about how Black people in those menstrual shows, that's how they entered into show business and MTV, hip hop and all that stuff. That's how they got um, cultural capitalism that goes into how hip hop has become what it is today. And then she talked about how rap can also be seen as that, but it can also be seen as a struggle to preserve an identity while embracing stigma. So how, how we're just so used to um shaming people, we're so used to punishing people, but we never we also we always get incarceration is also cultural. So we're always giving carceral responses to how we think about accountability, which we we should have been thinking about retribution, restoration and rehabilitation. So restorative justice um, practitioners, um, mental health um, 
counselors, therapists, and rehabilitation um, doctors and stuff like that. There needs to be some investment into that rather than shaming and wagging your finger at person pulling yourself by the bootstraps when you don't have any bootstraps. And then chapter five was, it's really the most hectic chapter, very in length, because that's pretty much the, the driving force behind the book. So she first introduced this chapter with um, where are the Black Fathers and stuff like that. How there was this um, era in pop culture. I think even Tyra Banks had an episode on where are all the good Black men. Um, and um, Bill Cosby, um, his message of of black boys need to pull pull their um pants up and stuff like that ha ha about bill cosby <laughs> and um obama and barack obama when he was going to a church and it was this message of personal responsibility that um he was um messaging he said if we are honest with ourselves we'll admit that too many fathers are missing missing from too many lives and too many homes too many fathers are mia too many fathers are awol they have abandoned their responsibilities they're acting like boys instead of men and the foundations of our families are weaker because of it you and i know this is true he was talking to this to an african-american um audience so i need so we're we're supposed to be in this post racial society when um Obama um uh, won the presidency, and we're not talking about mass incarceration, unemployment, and why a lot of black men are incarcerated and why some of them aren't even present in their households. So yeah, so we we don't. It's a lot of um. Alexander went into wow, we know incarceration there's this bias in prisons of black people but we don't put two and two together and she wonders why is that and she said racism manifests in so many structures so we don't even put like we don't even think about how teachers don't even they have to pay out of their own pocket for to make up their classrooms and why prisons are are um, filled with black people and stuff like that. So we don't think about those correlations and stuff like that. And she said, racism manifests in structures, not just stereotypes. And those structures perpetuate those stereotypes. And she had this wonderful metaphor about a bird cage. And she said, one theorist, Iris Marion Young, relying on a famous birdcage metaphor, explains it this way. If one thinks about racism by examining only one wire of the cage, so think about the prison system, or one form of advantage, it is difficult to understand how and why that bird is trapped. So why are black kids in detention and juvenile, why are black men unemployed, because of the prison system, the school to prison pipeline and all that stuff. So we don't, ra we haven't thoroughly rationalized and actually made sense of why black people are in these inferior um, positions. And she said, only a large number of wires arranged in a specific way and connected to one another serve to enclose the bird and to ensure that it cannot escape. So pretty much how the racial caste system always it traps black people, so whether that's through surveillance, whether that's through um, lack of funding for health care and education and jobs, lack of infrastructure, um, uh, medical racism, environmental racism, um, colorism, cultural appropriation, like the list is endless on why black people are in the position we are right now. And we don't think about, and all we can think about is black people chose to do crime. And um, she um, went into um, this these, um, process into how mass incarceration um, works. There's these phases of the birdcage. 
So first she talked about police roundup. So why certain communities are heavily police, why police um are chose to arrest certain individuals and um why the police are um get more funding because of the drug war and stuff like that. And the second phase is conviction. So the the um bond hearings and stuff like that. So it's hard because cash bonds, some a lot of cash bail systems, they're very expensive and stuff like that. So some people a lot of people don't even get to trial. Like 90% of people don't even get to trial because they couldn't afford trial or afford a lawyer or something like that. So once you get a trial, you're very lucky. And good luck if you're not guilty and stuff like that. And then the third phase is invisible punishment. So that's um, the felon label. Um, you lost your right to vote. You lost your right to get a job. Lost your right to housing. Lost your right to get affordable education. Lost your right to um, get all these things that should be public goods and human rights. But you're you're very disenfranchised from society. And then she went a little bit about the history of um, prisons. So here's a history lesson. Um, I promise it not to be long. <laughs> Race has always influenced the administration of justice in the United States. Since the day the first person opened, people of color have been disproportionately represented behind bars. In fact, the very first person admitted to a U.S. U.S. penitentiary was a light-skinned Negro in excellent health, described by Nazerva as one who was born of a degraded and depressed race and has never experienced anything but indifference and harshness. So, the first person who was ever put in the U.S. prison system is a light-skinned Black man because of miscegenation. So, the prison system isn't broken. I think a lot of people don't think about that. A lot of people haven't internalized that. The U.S. prison system is doing what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to be locking up a lot of black and brown people in there. It's supposed to um, have all these police officers use their discretion to justify their racism. It's literally built to do that, 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 it, that it is not broken. It's always been acting like this, even the prisons in other countries, because the United States is a prison model and is the most incarcerated um, country in the world. And it's only 5% of the popu of the world's population. So you have to, um, you have to put two and two together. Is what I, this is what I have to say. And then um, Alexander um, tried to compare um, mass incarceration to Jim Crow and how mass incarceration in prison industrial complex is our new Jim Crow and our racial caste system that we know today. So the first, the first um, thing she said is that there were a lot of political origins that justified Jim Crow and uh, the prison industrial complex. Um, Jim Crow was used to um keep poor working poor and working white class people away from black people because they they know there's going to be an uprising if the poor working whites and blacks they create solidarity raise consciousness and might overthrow the elites because white elites they're afraid of their power being uh they're not willing to sacrifice their power for the common good because they're so they feel so entitled. They benefit a lot from it, and that's the same reason for mass incarceration. Because um, you think about politics and how law and order and police has been used to for political gain. That um, um, white politicians go to these white rural communities in the South to um to affirm um poor working whites affirm their whiteness and how they should feel superior and all these um predators are um going to be after your white <laughs> whiteness and stuff like that and then there's this um the political competition that republicans and democrats have is the same way with jim crow who can um who can we um segregate more um, who can we be tougher on crime and stuff like that? And legalized discrimination. Um, 
you can legal you can legally discriminate against black people to vote and stuff like that. You can legally discriminate felons for to vote. And political disenfranchisement and this is something that I never got to and that I was just introduced introduced to. So you know how the electoral college it was used because because of plantation owners and their slaves. But think of the U.S. Census Bureau. So prisoners, they're counted in where they're incarcerated. And a lot of com- places where they're incarcerated are white rural communities. So that gives those communities more representatives. So it's literally gerrymandering at work because you can redistrict and stuff like that. You get more there's more population in that area. You need more representatives. So we're taking, and it takes away from communities. And it takes away representatives from the communities that those who were incarcerated are originally from. So that gives you a loss of a political voice and stuff like that. So that's something that I learned after reading that. And then the exclusion of exclusion of black jurors, Supreme Court biases, because the Supreme Court, they justified Dred Scott, they justified separate but equal and Plessy versus Ferguson. And it's the same thing with McCleskey versus Kemp, which um, allowed um, prosecutors to justify why, why they get to have so much power. And how a lot of this creates um, our culture and how we um, articulate race relations in the United States and stuff like that. And there's also some racial segregation. There was some segregation between white prisoners and black prisoners. So it's the same thing with Jim Crow, how white people are in certain communities and they get better treatment. They got more better employment opportunities than black neighborhoods and stuff like that. And then... Um, she talked about the differences, the notable differences. So Jim Crow was explicitly race. It talks about it talks about a race um, explicitation. And but when you're um, a felon, there's this stigma. So Jim Crow, it was easy for the black community to unite in um, civil rights and, and stuff like that. But with uh, mass incarceration, black it turned it made the black community turn against itself, and there was um, because of um, there was this secret within the felon within black households and stuff like that. So it's a hidden secret, and um, it made them more disunited. So, and and there were some black communities they have more wealth and stuff like that, so they didn't have to, they didn't have. Um, problem as much problems with policing and stuff as compared to urban low income um black communities so there is this finger wagon and respectability politics that obama bill cosby and um who else um louis farrakhan they um uh they gained out of the um, respectability politics and um another um there's this absence of racial hostility. So there is this, um, so it's easy for white people to say they're not racist and stuff like that, but they haven't um, internalized like the black, I do they have any black friends, um, microaggressions, um, you know, personal, interpersonal racism that they didn't get to um, challenge within themselves. And and because of, of colorblindness, <laughs> there are, um, white people get arrested. Um, white people get um, killed by police. White people um, are in the prison system as well. But it's the way laws and policies work because um, Alexander talked about the issue of drunk driving, how a lot of drunk driving um, killings happen um, because of um, white suburban uh, men and how that doesn't get covered compared to drug crimes. Because drunk driving, you're more likely to die from drunk driving than drugs and stuff like that. But there's no crimina- there's no criminalization of drunk driving. And you wonder why that is? <laughs> And um, 
there was this um this is the um, notable support from black communities on um the get tough policies and how uh, some people sometimes black people be complicit in anti-blackness and um she said it right here how it's um it's very com it's very com more complex than that because people don't really know how to deal with accountability. So they're not like, if they're if you're not exposed to something, you're going to go the easy way route about, you're going to know the, like, the first thing that comes to your face, and that's police. And that's what um, Alexander notes, the complexity of it. And she said, given this history, it should come as no surprise that today some Black mayors, politicians, and lobbyists, as well as preachers, teachers, barbers, and ordinary folk, folk endorse get tough tactics and spend more time chastising their urban poor for their behavior than seeking meaningful policy solutions to the appalling conditions in which they are forced to live and raise their children. The fact that many African Americans endorse aspects of the current caste system and insist that the problems of the urban poor can be best explained by their behavior, culture, and attitude does not, in any meaningful way, distinguish mass incarceration from its predecessors. So it's easy to um, tell the masses what they should do, except beside rather than tell the people in power who have the power to fix what the masses have been going through to um deal with um the situations and the problems and she also said the genius of the current caste system and what most distinguish distinguishes it from its predecessors is that it appears voluntarily so people choose to commit crimes is this idea that she said and that's why they are locked up or locked out we are told this feature makes the politics of respectability particularly tempting as it appears the system can be avoided with good behavior but herein lies the trap all people make mistakes all of us are sinners all of us are criminals all of us violate the law at some point in our lives in fact if the worst thing you have ever done is speed 10 miles over the speed limit on a freeway you have put yourself and others at more risk at harm than someone smoking marijuana in the privacy of his or her living room yet there are people in the united states serving life sentences for first-time drug offenses something virtually unheard of anywhere else in the world so talks about the culture of the United States when it comes to um, punitive and carceral responses to um, uh, problems. And then the final chapter, y'all. Um, she called it the fire this time, which um, geeks me because that that's um it's um in reference to um James Baldwin, the fire next time. He's fire. James Baldwin's one of my favorite um writers. And um, and the fire this time, she talked about um, mass support and mass grassroots movements and how they should address and how they should be formed. So she talked about this case, I think, in Louisiana of six black children. They were caught in a fight between a white person who was racist a white child that was racist there were noose involved and then they were about to um be sentenced to um a state prison but they ended up not having to go to prison because there was a lot of mass support there was even a lot of civil rights advocates that um in support of the kids and alexander was wondering so if it wasn't for that noose because y'all understood the history of nooses and how lynchings and stuff, there's this, how you under, you'll understand that racism, but you won't understand that white child um, mistreating that black children and those black children were protecting themselves and defending themselves against the racist attitudes of that white person. So, and she talked about how it was so many celebrities, like Ice Cube, Moss Def, and Al Sharpton were there because so, because it's respectability. And she said... And she talked about that's literally civil rights history. If you're respectable and you've been still been mistreated, then the civil rights um, people got your back. Because she talked about um, Rosa Parks' story. And those for y'all who don't know, Rosa Parks wasn't the first person who refused her seat out of the bus. It was um, Claudette Colvin 
who was um, 15 years old or 16 years old at the time. She was a teenager and she's darker skinned and Mary Louise Smith. Um, it was two people that did that did something before War for Rosa Parks did. And um, Claudette Colvin did not get the support and attention because she was pregnant. Um, so teenage pregnancy and stuff like that. So, and Mary Louise Smith, she had a father that had, I think it was a drug addiction that she, that he had. So there was no support for her. And it wasn't even because of her. It was her father. And then Rosa Parks was a perfect, was a, a, a dream for the civil rights movement because she was respectable. She was a mulatto. She, well, I don't know if she was a mulatto, but she was light skinned. And um, she had professional clothes and she worked with the NAACP and stuff like that. So it was easier to get behind her. And, um, and she talked about how we should be rethinking our collective denial and rationalizations of why Black people are in prisons. So think about how the prison industrial complex, a lot of people are in there because of the set conditions, the rules we set in stone and this, and what we, um what policies we enacted to um, put people in prison rather than it's their fault that they're in prison. So instead of taking an easy way um, out and she talked about how the civil rights movement, there was this silence. And I know Martin Luther King Jr., He even he um, 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 severe ties with um, notable activists during the civil rights movement because he got into a class analysis and a more of a revolutionary politic because he um, got uh, worked with um, Poor People's Campaign, the Poor People's Movement, and um, the anti-Vietnam War activism that was going on before his di before he died. And civil rights advocates were more mostly focused on litigation, and um, it became corporatized. So it's to the point where advocates they were um, they had their own agendas. And they only, if it's only, it's a legal, it's more of a legal crusade than a moral crusade. And you're only going to, and it's only based on the law and stuff like that. So they're not going to be Harriet Tubman. <laughs> These civil rights lawyers, they're going to, they're not going to be Harriet Tubman. They're not going to, um, they're going to be sticking by the status quo. It's what she um, talked about. And... She also talked about how prisoners tend to be erased from data. So employment rates and stuff like that, they don't count prisoners. And um, there should be this, there should be an interconnectedness between how prisoners are treated to um, other um, institutions of the United States. And she said what needed to be said, um, reform efforts aren't enough. So you, the system is built what it's supposed to be doing. It's not broken. You can, you can, um, if um, we should be focusing on not pe putting people in prisons, like we should not be punishing people because people make mistakes. We're human, and no one should be, and no one wants to go to prison. And I think that's that's should be how we moving in our policies and stuff like that. What are we doing? What can we do to prevent people from doing, making these questionable choices in these things that are considered unlawful? And she said that prisons need to be shut down. <laughs> and a lot of people work in prison. So there needs, there needs to be a deindustrialization effort of prisons because prisons are, Prisons are also privatized, so corporations, corporations of America, and stuff like that. Prison labor, Walmart benefiting from prison labor, Amazon benefiting from prison labor, um, is literally a system of exploitation. If the prison industrial complex keeps going and these prisons are still operating, and if and if you're worried about your job, you're putting profits over people, and. Um, yeah, she said on this page. 
Yeah, she said even beyond private prison companies, a whole range of prison profiteers must be reckoned with if mass incarceration is to be undone, including phone companies that gouge families of prisoners by charging them exorbitant rates to communicate with their loved ones, gun manufacturers that sell taser guns, rifles, and pistols to prison guards and police, private health care providers contracted by the state to provide typically abysmal health care to prisoners, the U.S. military, which relies on prison labor to provide military gear to soldiers in Iraq, which was uh, George Bush's justification to kill millions of people in Iraq, <laughs> and they, none of them did 9-11, and corporations that use prison labor to avoid paying decent wages, and the politicians, lawyers, and bankers who structure deals to build new prisons, often in predominantly white rural communities, deals that often promise far more, more to local communities than they deliver. So think about it. We will have free health care. We will have free college tuition if we divest it from prisons. So we would actually give safety by giving people resources and people don't think of it that way and the drug war must end period um we need to decriminalize um drugs and focus on rehabilitation we need to end these financial incentives that gives police reason to um arrest black and brown people and we need to invest in public defender office and meaningful reentry programs. So more f probably fel a, a plethora of fen felony friendly um, jobs, just just um, uh, eradicating felon discrimination. And she said that it must be a public consensus and a mass mobilized because Brown versus Board of Education and slavery, a lot of those wouldn't have never happened, the abolishment of slavery and Brown versus Board of Education, if there was no grassroots movement. It's people power. And we need to rethink police and prisons and how they create crime by leading, by the industrialization and taking away employment opportunities that were in urban communities and um, destroy this notion of colorblindness. So white people need to reckon with themselves. Y'all need to talk to your white family members about racism and how to um, support black people. Um, open your purse, um, support the cause, um, do what you can do to support black people, uplift our voices, support, um, um, support black businesses, um, <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, and, um, give us more space and more liberation of our human humanity. And, um... She also um, talks about the controversy within affirmative action. So she's happy that she said that affirmative action is very important. If it wasn't for affirmative action, we wouldn't have as many jobs. Like affirmative action, I probably wouldn't have been in Towson. Who knows? Um, I don't know if it was because of my high GPA at high school. <laughs> but um, and, but we really need to um, reconcile with why we have an affirmative action. We need to um, really transform our institutions. And affirmative action acknowledges the inequities, but it doesn't um, remedy the damage that has already been done. And um, she um, disapproved... Um, Black ex exceptionalism, which I agree, how black people need to conduct themselves to white approval. And even if you do that, they're going to call you the N-word. <laughs> um, think with Obama, like there are a lot of white people that said racist things toward Obama and he was the leader of the most powerful um, Amer empire of the world. So... She also um, said this thing about black cops, which I don't know how and how affirmative action, I will go back to affirmative action, they're seen as bribes. So 
similar to how poor and working white class people are um, affirmed of their whiteness. So there were racial bribes that were going 